Welcome back. We are in the second half of our ninth annual Annapolis Summit. Uh, about to have a conversation with Governor Martin O'Malley. Uh, we want to again uh, thank uh, all the people who sponsored and supported this. Uh, Kevin Manning and Stevens University have been with us since the beginning. As of course our partners, the Baltimore Business Journal, who produce this with us every year. I um, want to thank the Maryland State Education Association, the Maryland Department of Housing and Community Development, CSX, our sponsors, uh, of course WEAA, uh, and our sister stations on the Eastern Shore of Marvel Public Radio, uh, and uh, with the Bears Cable Channel for shooting it and offering this up to all the cable facilities across the state of Maryland as well, and realnews.com that will be broadcasting this across the nation. Uh, and I also want to welcome our high school students who are here from the Baltimore Freedom Academy, uh, and City Neighbors High School in Baltimore, uh, and also thank all of uh, uh, those people who sponsored the high school students to be here today uh, to pay for their tickets, which was a, a great outreach. We appreciate that a great deal. And all of you for coming in so early in the morning. And Governor Martin O'Malley, welcome. Good to have you with us. Mark, good to be back. How have you been? I'm, I've been very well. Good. I caught the last half of your show. It was very, very good. This should be interesting. This will be an interesting session. Lots of things coming up. It's always interesting. We never, so, we never lack an interesting. <laughs> We know, we know that you're not going to give us a sneak preview of your State of the State address. You could give it now, actually, <laughs> if you'd like. It won't go on until 5 or 6 o'clock tonight. <laughs> I guess that was a no. No. <laughs> Still working on it. <laughs> so, but clearly, some things will come out. Um, and the press has been talking a lot about the $1 billion deficit, structural deficit in the budget, $14 billion. And uh, rumor has it that you're going to uh, talk about a 15 cent uh, gas tax increase for the state of Maryland as one of the ways to deal with this uh, budget crisis. Could you talk a bit about that? Sure. Let me take a, let me back up a little sure. bit. Sure. There's, uh, since the day that I um, was blessed to take on this trust for the people of our state, we've faced um, difficult budgets. Uh, most of the bad math was of our own making. We increased, in a formulaic way, funding for really important things that all of us agreed were important, like schools, and yet we did not come together and forge the consensus necessary to fund those things. So that was the first sort of uh, budget challenge we had to address. That was followed by the biggest recession that our country's seen since the Great Depression, greatest number of job losses, and therefore um, you know, greatest dip in revenues as every business saw their own business bottom line dip during these last very, very difficult years. But nonetheless, every year we've come together and every year we've put forward from the O'Malley-Brown administration a budget that is not only balanced but is also within the spending affordability guidelines. What does that mean? That means that the parameters that were laid out by the legislative committees, we actually met. We didn't give them a work that was half in progress and say, you men and women, you go be the bad guys, and you choose what to cut and what not to cut. We've made all of those tough decisions. And, and even with that challenge, we've still been able to do things we weren't able to do in easier times. I mean, we've made college far more affordable than it was. We have protected more open space than in easier times. We have had our schools, thanks to the hard work of teachers and parents and administrators, named the number one schools among the 50 states, not just once, but three years in a row. And hopefully, we'll be able to continue that into the future. Um, unlike some other states that don't do long-term projections, we kind of pride ourselves on being very, very honest and very, very open about the math here, which is a good thing. That's one of the reasons that we do have a AAA bond rating. Uh, but it also means that we always have this sort of looming potential of a deficit on the horizon. Uh, there are three shortfalls that we're addressing right now, Mark. Um, one of them has to do with the operating budget. The other one has to do with the underfunding, the undercapitalizing of our infrastructure investments, particularly in transportation in a state that needs for its own survival to grow in smarter, more sustainable, higher density ways. And then the third one related to that one has to do with our water and wastewater infrastructure. So on each of, uh, let me go back through a few of those. Yeah, some of you may recall when we had the special session, some called it the special session. I prefer to remember it as the horribly difficult and impossible <laughs> session. Uh, we did, we did a number of things. We put in place a progressive income tax for the first time. We asked corporations to pay another 1% on their uh, corporate income tax, those that pay it anyway. 
And we also uh, ask all of us, regardless of income, to pay another penny on the sales tax. It wasn't popular at the time. Nobody liked doing it. No one liked asking. Uh, and I have yet to meet a delegate or senator that wakes up in the morning and says, by golly, the reason I ran for office was to be able to raise people's sales tax or any other tax. Nobody likes to do it. However, uh, taking those actions before this big recession fell on us held us in better stead. Uh, and we have been able to do things that other states have not been able to do because of that one penny uh, primarily. That was the biggest uh, revenue generator. And no one lost their home. No one lost the business because of that one penny on the sales tax that moved us from being the 42nd lowest to the 32nd lowest sales tax in the country. As we face this operating budget, and then I'll touch quickly and stop filibustering, as we face this uh, operating budget, uh, the operating budget is, is roughly, uh, you know, roughly a half million, a half billion, excuse me, this year, 500, six, 500 to 700 million, depending on how forecasts hold, uh, all of which could be addressed, and for the greater part in the future, by a one penny sales tax that would then move us from 32nd lowest to whatever. 23rd, 25th, somewhere in the middle. We don't allow a local sales tax. Some other uh, states, Florida, I think, uh, Pennsylvania, I believe, uh, allow the county to layer on a sales tax, the municipalities, the townships, and everybody else. So uh, that's one area where Maryland's actually very competitive and where our sales tax is lower than others. So that one penny could solve that operating problem. Shifting over to uh, uh, the transportation, we have, all, we have traditionally funded our transportation needs, our bridges, our roads, our tunnels, you know, by two primary methods. One is a user fee, the tolls, you know, through the tunnel, through the bridges, and you hear a lot of talk now nationally about doing a national infrastructure bank. In a way, we, we have a, uh, something similar to that in our Maryland Transportation Authority. It's a designated authority, all the tolls for the ICC, for the bridges, for all of that, go there and they have their own bonding capacity. On the other side of the equation though, for state highways and others, that's funded primarily by a gas tax. And that's true in, in most states. In our states, it is a flat tax. It is a tax that was imposed at its current um, 23 cents, I think, a gallon uh, back in 1990. 91 when the price of a gallon of gas was in the neighborhood of about $1.20. Now with gas at about $3.50, $3.40, uh, last summer I think it was up to $4.20, it's still that $0.23. Cents. And yet the population growth has expanded since the 1990s. The road networks have expanded since the 1990s. And these roads, these bridges and tunnels, they're not like trees. It's not as if you can water them and they grow bigger and stronger with age. They instead <laughs> They get older and they get rickety and you need to repair what you have and you also need to make investments in mass transit if we're going to have the infrastructure that allows us to grow in more sustainable ways. Um, under the former governor was passed a flush fee, flush tax, call it a fee, call it a tax. It all comes out of our pockets uh, and this is how we fund infrastructure, uh, in fact how every country does. Um, that was put in place and we did some good things. If you look at the trajectory of progress, the amount of nitrogen and phosphorus that was prevented from being dumped out of our sewer treatment plants and into the rivers of the Chesapeake Bay, it had a tremendous effect. Uh, that too, though, is a flat fee, $2.50. If you own a very, very, very large house that has a giant swimming pool and seven uh, full baths, you pay the same $2.50 a month that a widow living in the 1600 block of West North Avenue pays. And uh, uh, the bottom line is that the revenues for that uh, are not keeping pace with the needs that we have to clean up the bay, which is uh, Chris Van Hollen likened to trying to run up a downward moving escalator. So uh, where does that leave us? That leaves us with the need to um, do something on the operating, to do something on the transportation, and to do something on the, um, on the flush or the uh, water, wastewater um, infrastructure. So they'll all go up? Well, or, or not. I or mean, not. There's nobody that forces these things to happen. I mean, all of the men and women that you elect that come here uh, make decisions based on what they believe is in our best interest collectively, and they do it for a brief four-year period of time. And if you don't like the decisions they've made overall, you vote them out and you put somebody else in. There has been a um, Blue Ribbon Commission that has recommended the much uh, uh, talked about 15 cent 
increase. Their goal, I think, uh, the target that they've set is to raise, uh, be able to invest an additional 800 million a year. That's what the Blue Ribbon Commission came up with. Now, keep in mind, they don't have to labor under the uh, uh, under the discipline of the art of the possible, nor do they ever have to run for election or re-election. Um, and so the governor think it's a good idea. And then the other one was the flush tax. <laughs> and similarly, there was another group of individuals uh, who care passionately about the Bay and passionately about the jobs that can be created from this infrastructure. And they've recommended, I think, a tripling of the, of the flush tax. Right. So somewhere here, we're going to present a budget that comes up with what we believe is the art of the possible in a time when all of us are still trying to come out of this recession. And keeping in mind, though, that the top priority for us, notwithstanding that long explanation, is jobs and job creation. And it's not mark a Democratic or Republican idea. It's a historic and economic truth <clears throat> that in order for a modern economy to create jobs, it requires modern investments. So without saying you're going to do it, <laughs> we are looking at a discussion in this session about raising the gas tax X number of cents, 5, 10, 15 cents, raising the flush tax. Uh, and, uh, I mean, that is going to be on the table. Yes. You're just not saying how much at the moment. Or, right. I mean, we'll, be rolling these, we'll be rolling these proposals out over the next few days. I'll be meeting with the presiding officers, uh, Speaker Bush and, and President Miller, and also leadership. And so we'll be rolling these out. There'll be no secrets about them. There won't be any sleight of hand. And then together, as a people, we're going to decide how far we want to go, what we think is the right and balanced approach in order that we are able to give our children the best possible education we can in order to create jobs to get our people back to work and to get our state rolling forward again. Uh, there's, some, there's different ways to go about this, Mark, and without getting too ship in the bottle, um, it doesn't have to be all gas tax. We tried to diversify the transportation uh, investment funding by designating a portion of that corporate income tax when we raise it. Because the argument is, um, as uh, many of you have heard, is that, look, if we're building green vehicles and hybrid vehicles and electric vehicles that we hope use less and less gasoline, and yet the manner that we've chosen traditionally to fund the roads and bridges and the tunnels upon which those vehicles travel is a flat tax on that commodity gallon of a gasoline, then even if you were to pull together the political will to raise that flat tax on a gallon, you're raising it on a commodity that we all hope for the sake of, I should say, the younger people here in our planet, on a, on a commodity that we hope we're using less and less of over time. So, I mean, there's ways you could do it with uh, fees. There's ways you could do it. Uh, uh, I, I saw, read something interesting. Um, Antonio Villaragosa, the mayor of Los Angeles, I believe is pushing or has passed um, a half cent uh, sales tax that then they use to support the issuance of bonds for a sort of build Los Angeles program to invest in infrastructure and things. So there's a number of different ways to so go. So what are the ways it. you're thinking about beyond the gas tax? What do you think, what, what, what are the ideas that you would contemplate putting on the table to raise the funds needed to do what you think has to be done in the state of Maryland? Well, we've only got an hour. Um, let's, let's say, you know, you can, you can narrow it down. You Look, I, I'd prefer, um, uh, rather than, we're still looking at a lot of these things, and a lot of this will be shaped <coughs> by discussions with the leaders of the General Assembly um, and, and forging that consensus. Um, the, I would prefer to do something that, it, if, frankly, if I had my druthers, I'd rather do the one penny on the sales tax that gives us flexibility, have that um, address our operating needs, and then transition that into the sort of uh, revenue stream that then allows us to do greater bonding capacity for the transportation. That's what I'd like to do. Uh, but I'm, I'm, while the governor's uh, you know, one very, very important player here, it requires a majority of the House and the Senate to pass these things. And Where does gambling fit into this? It doesn't. I mean, not on the transportation. Not in terms of raising revenue? On the operating? Expansion of gambling? It's, uh, I'm not interested in, I, I had hoped that I would have, um, I would hope that I would have had some of my last debates and discussions around the uh, thorny topic of uh, using gambling proceeds to fund public goods. So I, I'm not terribly interested in going back and revisiting that, Mark. There might be some other people that do. 
and, and that's why we elect so many individuals to represent us. The, um, we have five locations, and now that we're coming out of this recession, more of them are getting up and going, and looks like we have some real promise on the location in Baltimore. But the gambling, the gambling is only part of what we do. You know, our parents didn't build the Bay Bridge on the back of bingos or bake sales. Uh, and we haven't, you know, we didn't win the Second World War by blackjack, you know, or by charging it to our kids' credit cards. So we, the, the, you get what you pay for, and you know, there, there will be some discussion about public-private partnerships. We did a good one at the Port of Baltimore, but even that, I mean, there is no innovative way to build a $10 million bridge or a $100 million bridge for $10 million. I mean, those sorts of innovations don't exist, not in the real world. Maybe at Alice's Tea Party they do, but not in the real world. <laughs> so, so we've got to figure this out, and there's a number of different approaches we can use, and, um, but the the biggest, the overarching issue in this, in this session has to be, I mean, I th we have to stay focused on job creation. If we're not creating jobs, none of the other things are possible. If we're not creating jobs and expanding opportunities for the next generation, we can't pay our bills, we can't uh, create a better world, we can't improve the Chesapeake Bay, we can't fund the police officers and keep them on the street, we can't fund drug treatment or health care or those other things. So job creation is critically important. And hats off to all of you. I know we are Baltimore Business Journal sponsored this. I know there's a number of people here from Chambers of Commerce around the state. Maryland's private sector job creation last year, at least for the 11 of the 12 months, we're still waiting on December. Uh, we created in our private sector eight times the number of new jobs that our neighbors in Virginia created. Overall, if you put public and private sector together, our job creation in Maryland, a smaller state than Virginia, was two and a half times what our neighbors in the Commonwealth of Virginia uh, have been able to do. And a part of that, a part of that is the environment that we create with a highly skilled workforce, with a place that nurtures innovation, uh, with the investments that we've made so that our construction trades hard hit by the housing collapse are not totally down and out because we've been able to do more on school renovations, water wastewater projects, open the ICC and move forward with other important things. So you, know, you, you make, and yesterday you did it again, talk about the importance of education and pushing education. Last year the uh, uh, educational funding was fairly flat, $70 million was put in by the legislature at the end. Um, if you go by the Thornton f formula, it'll call for $148 million more and for pushing maintenance of effort and insisting the counties uh, meet their obligations because we was $243 million shy for the students who, in those counties. Uh, so what is your plan there for this coming session? Every year we have funded record high amounts in education funding. Uh, it has greatly escalated over the last five years. Uh, that escalation has not been as dramatic over the last perhaps two years of the budget, but we have funded record high amounts in terms of operating funding as a state, uh, uh, record investments in school construction, and the proposal this year to the General Assembly will be the second highest amount in school construction, 372 million. The highest amount we did was at first budget that Lieutenant Governor Brown and I had, actually at his urging, $402 million because we've gone through such a, a backlog and there was such a proliferation of temporary learning shacks. The young lady uh, uh, from uh, in the prior session said, why does it seem like if education is the top priority, every year we're facing cuts in education? When we fund education, it's a joint responsibility of two aspects of our government. One is the state and one is the county. For a lot of parents, if you ask them, uh, those that are proud of where they send their children to school, you know, where does your child go to school? Uh, they will tell you, I, we go to county schools or we go to the city school. I've never heard a parent say, by golly, I take my kid to a state school. But as a state, the reason why we have such a strong workforce is because we've made such a strong investment because of our strong consensus and the primary importance of education for the economic future of our state. Um, so half of that is state, half of that is the counties or Baltimore City. Uh, in some of the wealthier counties, uh, the state's portion 
is less than right. it is in some of the poor uh, jurisdictions like the city of Baltimore. But overall, uh, what's part of the pressure here is that as the um, counties have had to face this recession themselves, and they saw that the state was continuing its big investment in education, they have tried to find ways, not all counties, many counties have tried to find ways to do less in education from the county side of the uh, uh, pocket uh, because the, the state was keeping pace with it. So uh, <coughs> all of this comes down to, um, in this session, we have to wrestle with that issue of maintenance of effort, which simply says, look, if we as a people are going to be putting more into education as a state, we cannot allow the counties to do less uh, on their end. This is a shared responsibility. We're all in this together. And no doubt the pres Senate president is very insistent that there be a greater uh, sharing on uh, uh, pension funding uh, like there is in terms of capital investments and the operating. So these will all be things that we'll wrestle with. There was a, a one of the most controversial things I think you did in this last year um, was when you sent a letter about the Maryland, uh, to the Maryland Law School Clinic, uh, Environmental Clinic. I apologize Clinic. for my cold. I'm not, I'm not becoming sad at the remin reminiscence. <laughs> <laughs> or the questions. I thought yeah. maybe it was the questions. I wasn't sure. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and, uh, and, uh, and, and in, the, in the letter, you kind of, you, you denounced the case against Purdue and the uh, Hudson's as questionable. And I'm curious uh, why you did that, uh, on what basis as a, as, a, as a lawyer, or somebody who thinks about these things, you did it. Um, the, the, you know, the, the courts have dismissed some of the Purdue briefs. Um, and I'm just curious why you, you pushed that, and do you think that, and very frankly, do you think that it was appropriate for a governor to do that in the midst of an ongoing case? Yes, I do. And I've held my tongue for a long time on that case, hoping that it would uh, resolve itself and hoping that um, a better sense of balance and judgment might prevail in terms of the plaintiff's case, which assuming that it was well motivated at its outset, I think as time went on it became pretty obvious that um, I, I, I not only called it questionable, I think I said it was an injustice. You did that say that. Being you, said done, it, you used the word injustice. You did. That was being done to the Hudson family, uh, family farm. If, if one were to look at the progress that we've made in stopping nitrogen, phosphorus, sediment runoff across the various sectors, urban, suburban, farm. Um, the, the, the farm sector has actually made a lot more progress than we've made on stormwater, than we've made on septics, and until very, very recently, uh, than we've made on, uh, this, on the uh, wastewater uh, front. So I, I attended the University of Maryland Law Clinic. And, uh, Which one? Uh, at University of Maryland. Oh, at this, in this clinic? Yeah, I don't know that we had quite the divisions. I'll tell you, my specialty was uh, ex partes, uh, domestic violence, and, and those sorts of um, issues for um, uh, women of limited means that needed representation in, in, in court. So I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of the law clinic. I understand the important academic freedom set question here, but uh, uh, the to go after a, a farm family that has not the means to be able to defend themselves with the deep pockets that are provided by you and me as taxpayers of this law clinic that was set up to represent people that can't afford representation is, I believe, an injustice. And uh, I think it is, uh, I think the suit was ill-advised. I've met with the uh, uh, the dean of the law school, who I have a lot of respect for, and she and I uh, disagree on this case. And it was not a lack of information upon, on my part that led me to this conclusion. And, uh, you know, so it's, it's so, in court. So one of the biggest parts of this case, and there's just one more question about that, then we'll move on to other issues, is that this was part of the case was to um, say that Purdue was as liable as anybody else for chickens that they own that are raised by the farmers for them. Um, and, uh, th and, and that was kind of the, uh, pursuing that case. And that's A and B. Do you think that this is going to lead you or other people in the legislature to cut back on funding for the law clinics? Well, I don't know what the ramifications would be for, I think they got a, I think the law school got a, um, a pretty rough way to go from some of the legislators who uh, 
represent either the Hudsons or, or, or farmers like the Hudsons, uh, many of whom are, you know, feel like they could be next, that there's no telling where, uh, uh, where it might land. And maybe that's perhaps the chilling effect that the, those pushing the suit and behind the suit are looking for. There's a lot of things we, um, um, so I don't know what the, the legislative fallout may be from that. I mean, I've, I've said what I have to say on that issue. Uh, I took a lot of time writing that letter, picking every word, every phrase, and then uh, wrestling it past my legal counsel <laughs> so, that, so that she didn't take out the good stuff. And uh, there's a lot of things that we do to damage the, the bay. Um, I'm sure that there's a, a place for, for suits when all else fails and the legislative process breaks down. but. I, I, I believe that this suit is an injustice and is doing an injustice to the Hudson family. And were it not for family farms in Maryland, you would see already uh, acres and acres and acres of irreplaceable and uh, damage, uh, uh, or, or you would see acres and acres and acres of land lost to McMansions, septic housing developments, and a lot more damage than responsible farmers do in raising the food that the rest of us eat. We are here at our ninth annual Annapolis Summit. I'm Mark Steiner. We have a Governor Martin O'Malley, uh, and uh, we are going to take a very brief break and come back. Welcome back. <laughs> we are here with Governor Martin O'Malley at our ninth annual Annapolis Summit. And we want to encourage our audience to uh, join us at the mic uh, and to have your questions asked. And we, as usual, we will, uh, I'll intersperse my thoughts in between these, but uh, we will begin, as always, with our sister radio station, Del Marble Public Radio, uh, and their news director. Don Rush from Del Marble Public Radio. I wanted to ask you, Governor, about uh, Plan Maryland. There's a lot of pushback from some of the rural state legislators, uh, Mike McDermott, amongst others, E.J. Pimpkin, and so on. And matter of fact, one, I think, has said that this is essentially a war on rural Maryland. And their objection is uh, that they will not, they feel they might not have as much input as they would like in terms of how the planning goes. What kind of assurances can you give the local authorities, the local governments, that they're going to have the kind of input that they think they need to ensure that they can continue to have development on the one hand while obviously uh, respecting the environment on the other? The, we've had a, Dom, we've had a number of meetings, um, including a, one that that I attended at the last, I believe it was Mako in Ocean City. So we've had a number of meetings on, on Plan Maryland. Uh, we'll continue to have meetings on Plan Maryland. Uh, there's a, a, a couple facts to, to keep in mind here. Um, the, um, there is a movement nationally to push back and to use any sort of state planning as a, a rallying cry and as a way to organize uh, people who are um, uh, in that portion of the party of Lincoln that one might call libertarians, uh, who believe that government should stay out of everything, including keeping government out of veterans' benefits and government out of Medicare and everything else the government does. But they, they push this notion that those of us who want to see a more sustainable growth pattern for states like ours uh, and want us to grow in smarter ways, that we're controlled by a transistor in the back of our heads by the United Nations and Agenda 21. I can't, I can't change that. There will be people to whom those arguments are appealing, and there will be elected officials who see the utility in organizing around that. Uh, we, um, we've been moving um, pretty methodically and very openly and very transparently in using modern technology like geographic information systems to map out for all Marylanders where our rem remaining green print is. That is to say, the green habitat, the woodlands, the wetlands uh, that our bay needs in order to continue to function as an ecological body, her, her organs, green liver, kidneys, lungs, if you will. Uh, that was followed by ag print, where we looked at the remaining farmland, contiguous agricultural tracts that we need to maintain if we're going to have farming economies. And now the next logical extension of that is all right, es establishing each side of the uh, page in terms of where all of us agree we've got to protect green, we've got to protect farms. Where is the area in the center 
where it makes the most sense for us to grow and where are the areas where it makes the least sense and does the most damage if we allow the proliferation of septic you know, uh, housing developments. And so that's what Plan Maryland is. Uh, the counties still have their prerogative and their land use authority. This isn't, Plan Maryland is not about taking away that authority. But what it does say is that as a people, as a state, we're not going to finance expensive and damaging and counterproductive sprawl as we might have in the past when we did not have the benefit of sound planning, good maps, and a citizenry that had the benefit of being informed by those things. Uh, some people have said, the critics of Plan Maryland have said, but there's no teeth in it. Uh, the, um, the, the, um, to those critics, I, I would say, well, first of all, in every budget, you should be able to look at the capital investments and know whether those investments are being made in areas uh, where they should and where they should not. Case in point being the new state health lab, which was going to go to a cornfield in Howard County, is now going in the heart of East Baltimore where the infrastructure exists, next to Johns Hopkins where the synergy and the job creation can happen. Um, but the real teeth to any of this, Don, is an informed citizenry. I mean, every county executive, every group of county commissioners has their limited butterfly time on the planet, and they go. But what we hope we're able to do in our short time in office in the O'Malley-Brown administration is to give people the tools so they can evaluate whether these decisions are sound, whether they're not, whether we're protecting contiguous farmland or we're protecting one-off pieces that were lost long ago, whether we're growing in ways that are good for the Bay or whether we're growing in ways that are bad for the Bay. And that's really what Plan Maryland is about. We have been required to have had a Maryland development plan since 1970, I always get this mixed up, 73 or 78, who's the aficionado here? But we never put one forward because of fears that the reactionaries or libertarians would you know, exact too much of a political price for even having the audacity to utter the word smart and sustainable planning. Those are three words. Thank you. Uh, Governor O'Malley, as you know, uh, poultry in Maryland have been routinely fed arsenic to make them grow faster and to make the color of their meat look more appealing to consumers. Now, a recent report from the University of Maryland that was commissioned by the State Assembly found that using arsenic in poultry production has led to negative environmental impacts on the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, given your stated commitment to protecting the Bay, can you support legislation that's been introduced in, this, uh, in the Assembly for two years now and will be introduced again to ban the use of arsenic in Maryland poultry production? I love the implicit, you hypocrite, in the word, <laughs> in the word stated. Position. It was very, very artfully done. Did, did you go to the University of Maryland School of Law? Uh, no, I didn't. Actually. Oh, <laughs> I did. Maybe that's why I have such an appreciation for your choice of language. <laughs> the uh, I looked at this a little bit last year. No, it didn't pass, right? So this did is coming pass. back around again. I'll be guided. I heard President Miller say that he would be guided by the science, and and so will I. I think some of the really promising. Uh, I think there's some promising new technologies on uh, sustainable farming and best management practices with this promise of this thing that's been referred to as the chicken house of the future that uses the same technology that takes the water off of NFL playing fields, uh, also takes the water out of uh, the chicken droppings, uh, requires that they not be shot up with as many of the uh, um, antibiotics. Uh, drugs, antibiotics, as they would require. Um, I, I, and it opens up markets because there are some countries that will not, you know, do not want to take in chicken that has uh, those sorts of non-organic elements in them. So I'll be guided by the science on this one. And if, if all you say is true and the science backs it up, then we'll have to uh, have that conversation with with the industry, which, by the way, is a very, very important industry, provides a lot of jobs. Agriculture still is uh, Maryland's, uh, one of Maryland's leading industries, depending on how you measure it. And for example, the well, report okay. from the University of Maryland scientists, so that would guide your decision on whether or not to support legislation banning arsenic and poultry? Yes, I haven't, I haven't seen it or read it, and I would, I would like to. My ABLE staff is here. Is it out? It's published? Uh, yes, it's, yeah, it's, it's out. Okay. Yeah. All right. I have a I have a number of things in my read file. Good morning, Governor. My name is Bill Fisher. I'm with the Maryland State Education Association. And uh, I'm here to talk about the Bose Bill. 
which has been defeated for the last six years, but it looks like it's going to be back again this year. Uh, for those of you who don't know, boast uh, uh, opponents, which include civil rights and public school advocates, have long argued that the bill would create a voucher tax credit of up to 75% and allow a business to divert up to $200,000 of its tax obligation to the general fund, something we can't afford this year. So we're looking to ask you, what will your position be on BOAST, and will you join Maryland's public schools and uh, civil rights advocates in opposing BOAST this year? Yeah, this was, Bill, this was one where we parted company last year. Uh, I had the BOAST, I think, had a cap on it of what, about $5 million, or I don't even think they put in any money to it. No. it was, they're hoping at some point when we had money to be able to put some dollars to it. The... The fifty-one percent of what your state tax dollar goes to is education, elementary and higher education. Fifty-one percent of every dollar. Uh, the five million that the uh, parents of kids that go to, you know, Orthodox Jewish schools or to Catholic schools or to other non-public schools, were hoping for out of this BOS bill is a very, 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 very small percent of what we invest in education. Stated a different way, as they do, imagine the huge amount of money it would require if all of the children of those schools were in our, our public schools. Now, I know there are those who would say, well, that'd be great. Send them all to public schools, and, and we should, and, and, and you should. So the, uh, I know that there's a lot of, I know that uh, people are passionate about this one. I, this is not one of those that I feel passionately about, and I have shared with the uh, hierarchy of my own church that in this time when the greatest amount of wealth in the, when we've seen the greatest concentration of wealth in the hands of the top one percent of our country has occurred over the last ten years I really don't think the tax cuts going to be the difference between whether a, a private school stays open or does not stay open I, I think it's largely a symbolic thing I understand why you're opposed to it symbolically but at the same time, I understand why those that sacrifice to send their children to religious schools uh, care about it symbolically. Ma'am? Good morning, Governor. Hi, Governor. Uh, my name's Betty Weller. I'm with the Maryland State Education Association. Last hour, we heard a pretty strong commitment from President Miller and Speaker Bush on fixing maintenance of effort. And my question to you is, can we count on that same strong effort from you? Yes. I mean, the... The main, it, it, does, it does our children no good whatsoever <clears throat> if the state is investing every year record amounts in education and then we have counties that are reducing their funding from their standpoint in order to fund you know, pennies on a tax cut. And so we do need to have some, we need to, have, we need to fix maintenance of effort and, um, and I look forward to working with you and the presiding officers in order to do that. Next question. Good morning, Governor. My morning. name is Jen Brock Cancellieri. I work with the Maryland League of Conservation Voters. Um, first, I want to thank you for your leadership um, over the first <coughs> term and the first year of your second term um, okay. on moving forward on cleaning up the bay and renewable energy. I wanted to ask a question about the latter today. Um, we've seen how recently in Massachusetts momentum is building on offshore wind. Their courts just decided um, that it's in the benefit of consumers and the public good. And New Jersey is also moving forward. Um, we think that there's a new American industry to be made um, from badly needed manufacturing jobs that could be brought to Maryland from offshore wind. And I'm wondering what policies you think the legislature could enact this session to make sure that Maryland um, isn't left behind. Well, one of the most important things uh, to advance offshore, the cause of offshore wind for Maryland, uh, happened w while the legislature was in recess, and assuming that the Public Service Commission ratifies the uh, settlement with Exelon on their uh, merger with Constellation Energy, we will be able to double our renewable portfolio in our state, and also Exelon has been willing to make a $30 million investment into sort of the stage one um, <coughs> development process of offshore wind. Uh, that's without the legislature doing anything. The legislature last year was very, very reluctant to pass the bill we <coughs> laid before them uh, that would commit all of us to a 20, 30 year uh, 
hedge, if you will, uh, in financing uh, offshore wind development. They did not want to be responsible for voting to add any pennies to anybody's bill. Um, and given the big mistake they made in deregulation seven or eight years ago, one can understand why they are gun shy. Um, but the uh, other states are other states see the benefit of this. Hopefully, we will. In the meantime, we have that thirty million dollars. Whatever the legislature can do this session, I hope they will do. And if uh, they're not ready to do what we quite as much as we had proposed last session, well, let's talk about other things we can do. We've seen the amount of distributed solar just, you know, exponentially increase. Granted, it was out of the basement and from a very small base, but we've really seen that take off by having a carve out within our 20% renewable portfolio for solar. Uh, perhaps we could offer a similar sort of preference for offshore wind that starts to ramp up, uh, you know, on the, on the reasonable horizon so the potential investors will see that we're serious about it. Uh, the um, price of any fossil fuels are eventually going to go up. They're in limited supply. And I agree with you that we could be creating a lot of jobs with offshore wind. And it's the, the most available, given the technology we have today, it's the most likely and abundant uh, renewable source that we have as a state. So I'd like to see it happen. Could the state do more by doing, um, by having, giving homeowners and property owners uh, greater tax write offs for putting in solar in their homes, for creating that as a, an alternative way of doing things, um, uh, to, to do things to motivate people, to motivate this change and pushing towards renewables. Yeah, the big challenge about uh, all of this, and if you'd like to see, see um, <clears throat> if you'd like to kind of uh, read something in a little greater depth, but in plain English on this, President Clinton's latest book, Back to Work, yeah. has some really, uh, really, really good passages on the challenge uh, of our uh, meeting our renewable energy goals as a country and also the challenge of our meeting our um, energy conservation goals. And it all comes down to financing. In some states, they allow you to take out a lien on your property tax bill and sort of pay off that upfront cost of either the solar installation or the weatherization on your property tax bill as a lien. Um, in other states, they figured out ways that they can do that with the utility companies, and you pay it off as part of your utility bill since you're already going to pay. And so hopefully we'll have some conversations about this and, and come up with better ways. Uh, having said that, uh, when you stack the credits from the state and that the president provided through recovery and reinvestment with some counties like Howard County and others that, are do, that offer county incentives, we've seen a lot more of this happening than has ever happened before, Mark. So let's it's go the back. financing. It's the that, financing. That's where the issue is. Let me go back here to the audience. Go ahead. My name is Sabrina Donick, and this is Constant, Constant Screen. We're from City Neighbors High School. And I was Where is City Neighbors High School? North City East. Neighbors High School. It's in Baltimore City in the Hamilton Your old area. Neighborhood, I guess that. But where <laughs> is the city? Hamilton. Hamilton. So, okay. Hamilton was that area. the old Hamilton Middle? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And... I'm feeling so ancient. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Miller stated before that you were um, all for charter schools earlier, but I was wondering, with the flat fee that all schools have right now, I was wondering what you're going to do with inflation increases for, school for schools, because right now we have a $2.8 million billion that needs on just maintenance in Baltimore City Schools, not counting the rest of the counties in Maryland. So I was wondering what you're going to do for inflation for the this schools. Is on the, this is on the capital, on the buildings and those yeah. sorts of things? Yes, right? just regular maintenance on the buildings. That right. needs to be updated right now. Well, the first thing we've done is that we've been investing more every year as part of the state's capital budget, not the operating, but the capital, although we've been investing more in the operating, too, into school construction. The difficulty we have as a state is that we don't really have a set mechanism when it comes to in uh, capital investments in our charter schools. So to the extent that it happens at some place like the seed school, they raise private dollars to make that happen. Uh, there have been um, uh, some discussions and some proposals that there should be a, a certain percentage of the uh, uh, school construction dollars that are designated for the public charter schools to compete for, which are also public schools. And, uh, 
When I was mayor of Baltimore, I think we created in those seven years more charter schools in Baltimore City than in the whole rest of the state combined. But it's still a work in progress figuring out how we properly maintain the capital plants of those schools. So stay tuned. Stay involved. Um, a quick question. The next person come up to the mic. Um, it came up on our show the other day. Uh, that we're, you're one of the few governors in the state of Maryland and in the United States of America that uh, can overrule a parole board. That you have final say on paroles, on pardons, on commutations. Um, some people think it's kind of when the parole board makes a decision that that should be it, and that is kind of an antiquated way of doing things, and then throw it in the governor's lap for you to make the decision. And so far, if I've read this stuff right, that uh, that you've um, said no to the parole board on commutations and pardons and paroles for those they said we should let go. Some of whom have been in jail since they were kids and are now in their 40s and 50s, some of whom are in their late 60s and 70s. Could you speak to that? Sure. Our state is the eighth most violent state in America, notwithstanding the fact that we have more PhDs per capita than any other state in America, and we ding all sorts of other bells that we would all agree are good things about our state. Um, we cannot escape the fact that we are still one of the top ten most violent states in the country. Are. There is no responsibility that any of us in public life have that's more important or more sacred than the decisions we make affecting public safety. Um, Baltimore City uh, went below 200 homicides for the first time in modern time, first time in memory this year. And there's a lot of people who've given their lives to make that happen. Uh, a lot of police officers and a lot of <clears throat> uh, civilians. So all of these are decisions that I take very seriously, Mark. I've approved about 12 pardons, I think. I have denied so far 53 requests for commutation of life sentences. and. Um, uh, there, the state itself has reduced overall, the state overall has reduced violent crime to its lowest levels since 1973. I take this responsibility very, very seriously. I read every case, and um, these are not decisions I make lightly, and uh, there is nothing that prevents people, once they get to a certain point, from making applications, so there are a lot of them. The legislature made a decision to put a time frame on when I make a decision mm -hmm. so that um, I, I, th I think that maybe some of them thought that the reason why I wasn't granting more was because I didn't know they were there. I do know they're there and I will abide by the time frame that the legislature has set. Um, many of these individuals, certainly those that are sentenced to uh, life imprisonment, have been involved in the taking of another life. and. As we know from looking at the perpetrators of very violent crimes and murders, often those that murder once murder again. And, um, uh, I th and I'm going to continue to exercise that, that discretion, mindful of the weighty responsibility that, that comes with it. Next question. Good morning. My name is Michelle Merkel, and I'm here on behalf of Food and Water Watch. And I think you were in the room when I asked President Miller and Speaker Bush about hydrofracking in Maryland. And All there right. seemed to be some confusion about whether or not there's a, currently a moratorium in place on fracking activity during the pendency of the commission's study. So I'd like you to clarify that. My impression is that there is no moratorium, in fact. And so would you support um, a ban on fracking activity until the commission finishes its analysis given that we know so much more about the ill effects of the industrial practice than we did when you established the commission. Yeah, I believe as a practical matter, while there's no moratorium on signing up leases and doing those sorts of things, um, the Department of Environment is not issuing any permits for this until we get the report back. The first report is due to come back, I believe, in August of this year year. And what I have asked them to do is, and what the legislature, was it, did I ask or did the legislature ask? What they have been asked to do is to come up with the gold standard. And in my meetings with those that are advocating for this, including some property owners, uh, it, and what I've asked of the industry is, what is the gold standard that allows us to, um, to extract natural gas without having to give up you know, the Savage River uh, for all times in order to extract it. So um, that's what we're looking for. And I believe that's what New York is trying to discover as well. 
mentioned that a permanent ban what? isn't actually one of the alternatives that the commission's considering. Does that mean that a permanent ban isn't one of the alternatives? So it's uh, not like you're looking for the way to do it the best that you can on those as opposed to not doing it at all. Right. Be, yeah, not doing it all may be actually a viable outcome. All right. Well, I suppose if they come back and they say that there is no gold standard that outweighs the risks, but in any extraction, whether it's of coal or whether it's of oil or whether it's of natural gas, um, there are risks. And the, so I suppose it's possible that they come back and say, uh, no way at all, uh, but that's not their charge. Their charge is to figure out what is the highest standard with the greatest amount of environmental protection that we can put in place. We have sure. only about two minutes left. Let me let the final word go for a student from Baltimore. Hello. We had only have a minute though, love. Okay. <laughs> My name is Valerie McCallum. I'm a Baltimore City student, and I'm um, a Baltimore Freedom Academy Middle School Student Council Vice President. And I wanted to know why is it so? Why why does it seem like we are focusing so much on county schools and not city schools? Like why don't we have as much resources as county schools have? Actually, the state has invested far more in city schools than we have in county schools. And I think it's because there are 24 jurisdictions in Maryland, 23 of them are counties. One of them is the city, which acts like a county. So I think, hon, when you hear people talking about schools and state and county, we kind of, you know, revert to talking about and, when, and funding language about the counties. But whenever you hear that, and we're also talking about the city. I can tell you that the state funds a greater percentage of Baltimore City's operating budget than we do of, of uh, other counties, with the possible exception, perhaps, of Somerset or Allegheny. I, I want to, uh, first of all, thank Governor Martin O'Malley for the hour sure. here, attending his uh, fourth, third Annapolis Summit. How many years have you been in office now? Not enough. Not man. enough. <laughs> <laughs> Annapolis, I'm going to thank you, Governor, for being with us today. Thank uh, I want to thank. Say too many. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I want to thank, of course, Baltimore Business Journal, our, uh, our partners in this, and Kevin, Dr. Kevin Manning, Stevenson University, the Maryland State Education Association, Maryland Department of Housing and Community Development, CSX, WEAA, who puts us on every year, and Zachary Coleman, who makes it happen as the engineer over there. Uh, thank our partners with the Maryland uh, Office of Cable for shooting this today and our partners at Eastern Shore, the Marvel Public Radio, uh, and of course my producers, Justin Levy and Cricket Arison, and Valerie Williams and everybody else who helped put this together today. Uh, thank you all for coming down to Annapolis, and uh, let's on to building a better state. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.